All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Good afternoon, and welcome to the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C.'s program on understanding the Iran nuclear deal. This is the first program in our new webinar series. Each month, we will be hosting a free webinar program on an important and timely global issue, offering students, educators, and the public an opportunity to gain access to important information and ask questions to experts. These programs are open to participants around the country and around the world. Before I introduce Reza Marashi, our speaker for the afternoon, I would like to highlight a few things. First, for the educators who are planning to use this for professional development credit, please submit your lesson plan using Common Core standards based on the discussion today and uh, email them to me by January 11th. If you have any questions, please feel free to call or email me after this program. Second, hopefully everyone was able to download the attached PowerPoint and resources on the login page. These are links to interested, interesting reports and articles on the Iran nuclear deal, as well as links to Reza Marashi's published work on the subject. And lastly, after Reza finishes his remarks, we will open the discussion up to, to questions from the audience. You may use the chat function on your screen to send your questions. Please include your name and organization when you write your questions, and we will do the, our best to answer as many questions as possible before the end of the program. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, get to the topic at hand. And uh, as we all know, over the last three months, the ongoing Iran nuclear negotiations have been in the news on a daily basis. After decades of sanctions, and strained diplomatic relations, the tides have shifted. Although there, have been, there has been movement and optimism, there are, are an equal number of skeptics and naysayers. It has created tension with the U.S. government, and our ties with Israel have been strained. Many fear that Iran will not follow through. Still, the question remains, what are the realities of this deal? Speaking to us today is Reza Marashi, who is currently the research director at the National Iranian American Council in here in Washington, D.C. Prior to his work at the Council, Reza worked in the Office of Iranian Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. And he has, his articles have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Foreign Policy, the Atlantic, as well as many broadcast outlets such as the CNN and Star and BBC, uh, just to name a few. So please welcome Reza Marashi. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, but I'm going to talk for a little bit about, you know, what happened in Geneva, um, how we got there, and then talk a little bit about what the road ahead might look like. And so bear with me. Uh, we'll get through all of that. We'll get to the questions. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully we can have a little bit of fun. Uh, so how did we get here? Because if you juxtapose where we are at today, having reached an interim nuclear deal in Geneva, versus where we were just a couple of months ago, uh, most people probably would have told you that if this is not impossible, then it's highly unlikely. So either the highly unlikely or the impossible has happened. Uh, and what's past is prologue. You don't really know where you're going unless you know where you've come from. So let's examine some of the things that brought us here. Uh, on the American side, uh, you know, one could argue that there's always been an appetite among some within the administration uh, to pursue a robust and sustained uh, diplomatic approach vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And that's critical because really the only two options that you have to disposal are, are war and diplomacy. Anything that happens between those two options is really just a stalling tactic that kicks the can down the road and delays the inevitable choice between these two options. You can have sanctions or secret assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists or uh, computer viruses like Stuxnet, but those don't solve the problem. Uh, all those do at the end of the day is give you leverage for when you eventually do sit down at the negotiating table. And this is the dirty little secret that most folks in Washington won't tell you. It's that everything that happens before the diplomatic agreement, even war, is for leverage. Um, and a perfect example of that is how the Iraq war ended. You know, uh, we reached a status of forces agreement uh, with the Iraqis. Uh, we also reached a, a drawdown date, December 31, 2011. Obama came into office and he tried to renegotiate that December 31, 2011 day. The Iraqis said, sure, we'll renegotiate it, but we're not going to give immunity to American troops. And we don't put American troops anywhere where they don't get immunity. 
the Iraqis knew that full well. That was their very kind way of saying, don't let the war get you on the way out. So that the war ended with the negotiation. Uh, so mindful of that, mindful of the fact that the Obama administration uh, decided to pursue uh, the diplomatic track as opposed to the sanctions and other forms of pressure track, we should ask ourselves why they decided to make that shift. And I think the decision to make that shift was entirely predicated on some developments inside of Iraq. Um, oftentimes, sanctions are attributed to the reason why uh, this shift has taken place. And I'll be the first to admit that sanctions certainly provide us with leverage over the negotiated table. Sanctions have certainly destroyed the Iranian economy, uh, and they've exacerbated you know, decades of mismanagement and corruption. And sanctions have also put an incredibly difficult strain on the Iranian people, uh, far more than the regime. But can sanctions produce an election outcome? Can sanctions alone cause uh, a government to change course? Uh, I would argue no, and let me explain why. Uh, in the run-up to the Iranian election, uh, common knowledge, uh, common assumption, was that the supreme leader uh, had to fix in. Uh, he would not allow anybody except his preferred candidate to win. And as a result of that, uh, this election was meaningless. And, and frankly, it wasn't easy to argue against that narrative inside Washington, D.C., because of what had happened in the 2009 election in Iraq and the subsequent human rights abuses that had taken place. Now, Iranian elections are neither free nor fair, but what they do provide is a potential open for not only the Iranian people, but political elites in Iran uh, to express uh, differences of opinion and to create a groundswell to potentially shift the narrative in Iran in a different direction. So after what's called the Guardian Council in Iran, it's like an upper chamber of parliament of uh, unelected officials, vetted the candidates and approved a handful of candidates that could run, somebody that was considered the most moderate or most pragmatic, if you prefer that term, uh, candidates uh, that was allowed to run ended up winning. Uh, the Iranian people decided to, to, you know, a couple of days before the election at best, to turn out and vote. There was 73% voter turnout. And 50.7% of voters have had to turn out and vote for a gentleman who is now uh, president, Hassan Rouhani. Uh, president Rouhani has a long-standing track record of trying to use diplomacy to solve Iran's conflict with the West. He was formerly Iran's chief nuclear negotiator in, 2000, in 2003 to 2005. Uh, and that period of time was when Iran was negotiating exclusively with the European Union. The Bush administration at the time refused to join the negotiations. And they actually reached a nuclear deal at the time, uh, terms that those of us in the West would consider far more favorable to Western interests than the terms that we agreed to in Geneva just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the Bush administration was unwilling to support the deal, and uh, Iranian moderates and Iranian reformists uh, were sidelined as a result of the domestic political practice side that was going on in Iran at the time, combined with the rug pull being pulled out from under them uh, by Western countries. If you fast forward a couple of years, as a result of this election, the former chief nuclear negotiator, who has a track record of trying to use diplomacy to solve his problems with the West, wins the election and becomes president. And the Iranian people turn out in massive numbers to show the regime you can cheat once, but you can't cheat twice. Uh, that opens up the opportunity for the Iranian president to pull back in a lot of people into his cabinet that support this process of uh, achieving Iran's strategic objectives by working with the West as opposed to working against the West. And I think that opening was recognized by the Obama administration. And that shift in narrative and that shift in policy and that shift in viewpoint inside of Iran uh, was recognized by the Obama administration. They sought to take advantage of it, and so far they have. Um, now, understanding that you know, sanctions can give you leverage, but you have to trade in those sanctions at the negotiating table, that's a good segue to ask ourselves, well, what does this deal entail? You know, what, what, what's the meat on the bones, per se? And I would argue that uh, on the American side, we've given some sanctions relief to Iran. We've uh, waived sanctions on the auto industry. We've waived sanctions on gold, petrochemicals, things of that nature. Uh, we've allowed Iran to access some of its uh, frozen money in foreign bank accounts. Uh, and, and, and this is all very important. And surely sanctions have played a role in creating that leverage for the United States. But that's not all Iran got out of the deal. And I would argue that those elements are, of the deal are not what Iran has prioritized. What Iran has prioritized in the deal uh, 
is a willingness to discuss the end game. Like where, where does this road lead? Because you don't know where you're going, any road can take you there. The Iranians have been consistently saying for over a decade now that they want the West more generally and the United States more specifically to articulate what kind of relationship do they want with Iran overall when the negotiations are done and a peaceful resolution to the mutual conflict is, is achieved. And I think those discussions had not been had prior. The only discussions that were had were very short-term discussions about short-term agreements on limited aspects of Iran's nuclear program. But a willingness to discuss, okay, where does this road lead? And, and what will the overall technical aspects of your nuclear program look like in a final deal, but also what will our relationship look like after an overall nuclear deal is had? That's something that very much interested the Iran, because they don't want to have a nuclear deal go forward and then us still trying to promote policies of regime change and destabilization uh, or maintenance of the conflict so that it continues to be at the precipice of a military conflict. That's not something they're interested in at all. And I don't think the Obama administration is either. And also, there's essentially been a tacit acknowledgement that there will be Iranian enrichment uh, on Iranian soil when a final deal is reached. Now, I chose my words carefully there. We do not acknowledge Iran's right to enrich. Uh, because, according to the U.S. government, we don't acknowledge any country's right to enrich uranium. But we've essentially acknowledged the reality that in a final deal, a more comprehensive deal, that will be negotiated over the next six months, there will have to be some enrichment on Iranian soil. There's no plausible diplomatic way to dismantle the entire nuclear enrichment infrastructure inside of Iran. And that's critical, because enriching uranium up to the 5% level uh, is what's used for energy. When you go above the 5% level, that's when things get a little bit dicey. Uh, Iran had been enriching up to the 20% level. That can be used to create medical isotopes for cancer patients. But the problem is going from 20% to 90%, which is used for weapons, is much easier to do than going from 0 to 20, the difficult part that Iran had already achieved. That uh, has a good segue into what the Iranians agreed to do on their end of the the Iranians agreed to stop enriching uranium up to the 20% level. That's very positive. They agreed to take the stockpile of uranium enriched to the 20% level and reprocess it into fuel rods, things of that nature, so that they won't have a growing or burgeoning stockpile of uh, uranium enriched to the 20% level. They've also agreed to limitations of uh, their uranium that's enriched to the 5% level. They've also agreed to reduce the stockpile of 5% enriched uranium that they have. They have a heavy water facility uh, that could ostensibly be used to create plutonium for a bomb. The Iranians have not finished constructing that facility, so they've agreed to freeze the construction of the facility for this interim six-month period while a broader deal is worked out. And the final status of what that heavy water facility might look like and what the technical aspects, the scientific aspects of that facility might look like will also be under discussion. So as you can see, by limiting the very critical aspects of the Iranian nuclear program, we've essentially doubled the amount of time that it would take for Iran to what is called break out and make a dash for a bomb. Whereas before, some people would argue that it might have taken anywhere between six to 12 months, we've doubled that time frame. And by doubling that time frame, by Iran agreeing to freeze certain aspects of its program and roll back other aspects of its program, you create a window of opportunity to pursue diplomacy, and that window of opportunity wasn't there previously because we were ramping up pressure on Iran, and the Iranians were ramping up pressure on us by advancing the technical aspects of their nuclear program. So you could essentially call this deal a freeze for freeze, if you will. But as I'm sure you've noticed in, in how I've outlined the terms of this arrangement, it seems like we in the West got a little bit more than the Iranians got. Uh, and and, and what, the reason why that is, is I would argue, is the Iranians are, are, are willing to lose small in order to win big. They understand that over the past eight to ten years, their government, uh, especially President Ahmadinejad, but also other hardliners in Iran, dug the country into quite a hole. And sanctions relief really isn't the only way you dig yourself out of that hole. You also have to repair your international uh, image. You have to pair, repair your international relationships, your foreign policy relationships. And you have to build a foundation of trust that, frankly, at this point doesn't exist. So the Iranians were willing to make a good faith effort to show that uh, the most pressing concerns 
regarding their program. Not all of the concerns, but the most pressing ones uh, could be addressed in an interim deal in an effort to facilitate a bigger deal, which is really their, their strategic objective, so that they can reintegrate into the international community and reestablish their relationships with the rest of the world that have been broken over the past eight to 10 years. So they're playing the long game. And that's positive at the end of the day, because we should be playing the long game too. We shouldn't only focus on the six inches in front of our face. We should also focus on, okay, now that the Iranians have agreed to make these limitations for their program for an interim period, how can we get these limitations and other limitations that we would like to see to become more permanent at the end of the day, to ensure that we have a comprehensive deal that will not be foolproof in preventing Iran from constructing a nuclear weapon, but will put such stringent verification and inspections in place that the likelihood of them being able to cheat and not get caught is slim to none. Slim to none. And, and that's realistically uh, the best that we could hope for at this point. And I think President Obama has done a great job over the past couple of days in distinguishing between the ideal and the realistic. And the ideal, of course, would be Iran not having a special program. The realistic is that we can't do anything short of, and not even war either, to ha get them to get rid of their program. So how do we use diplomacy to get them to make concrete, long-standing, verifiable limitations on the program? That's the good or the best that we can hope for. And we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So looking ahead, where do we go from here? Now that we have this interim six-month deal that has bought us a window of time to pursue a broader arrangement. Well, first and foremost, I would argue that it's critical to take these negotiations away from the limelight and make them private once again. Because um, you can't really negotiate in front of cameras or in front of journalists or with journalists waiting right outside the negotiating room. The smart thing that the U.S. and Iran did was that they had private talks with one another in the run-up to negotiations in Geneva to hammer out what the contours of this interim deal would look like. Then they brought that deal that they worked out bilaterally to the P, what's called the P5 plus one, the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. And then the six parties together with Iran dotted the I's, crossed the T's, and they were able to get a final deal. In addition to removing themselves from the limelight, I think they're going to have to try to figure out what the regional security framework in this part of the world is going to look like if and when a final deal is able to be reached. What does that mean at the end of the day? I would argue that since the end of World War II, the United States has essentially created and run a security framework, a security, uh, regional security framework or architecture in the Middle East. And countries that were not willing to play by the rules of the game that we created, uh, we sought to isolate and destabilize. Think of Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Gaddafi's Libya uh, and, and the Islamic Republic of Iran, Assad, Syria. Uh, these are countries that you know, we've long considered to be rogue states. We consider them to be rogue states not because of their ter terrible human rights abuses. The Saudis have a terrible human rights record too. It's because they were not willing to play by the rules that we've set up. Now, are the rules of the game in the Middle East changing uh, as a result of the Arab Spring, as a result of Iran's willingness to uh, negotiate in good faith as a result of increased flexibility on the part of the Obama administration? Time will tell. This is the hard part that we're going to have to negotiate at the negotiating table because Iran's nuclear program as a whole is a subset of a larger set of outstanding issues that uh, have caused the conflict between the U.S. and all, whether it's uh, state sponsorship of terrorism, whether it is, uh, you know, a support for those groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, and others. Um, Iran's human rights record is a serious cause for concern. Uh, but the Iranians also have a set of their own concerns pertaining to efforts to destabilize and potentially overthrow their government, to the various forms of sanctions that have been put in place, uh, and others, other sets of factors as well. Uh, so this is the laundry list of issues that are going to need to be discussed. And now you can see why it's important to have a six-month window, because, you know, a couple of meetings over a couple of weeks is not going to be enough time to unpack all of it. And it's been difficult enough to get an interim nuclear deal. To getting a final nuclear deal and figuring out how it fits into the broader regional security framework in the Middle East is going to be critical. Um, I think let me stop there and, and turn it over to some potential questions that folks might have 
Uh, and I'm happy to talk about anything related to this or any other questions you might have that are related to Iran, or Iran relations or anything like that. So thanks for listening. Great. So we already have a few questions coming in. Uh, David Winkler from Georgetown Day School would like to know, um, why is the Supreme Leader allowing Rouhani to do all of this? It's an important question. You know, um, he, uh, he does have the final say in Iran, but he doesn't have the only say. And I think this is a, a common misperception in the West that, you know, he rules Iran like a king would rule a country. Uh, I would argue uh, that that's not the case. Instead, Iran has what's called the Supreme National Security Council with a bunch of political elites who sit around the table. And uh, the range of views of the people sitting around the table differ, and they argue with one another. And whichever argument emerges victorious, the Supreme Leader has the propensity to support that argument and that course of action. Because the Iranian people turned out and voted in such high numbers for the new president, and his approach just so happened to counter the previous approach, the Supreme Leader didn't want to be seen as statting out on a limb, standing at the mountaintop crying against the direction that the vast majority of people had supported through the election. That makes sense. So he kind of got boxed in. Because if the Iranian people go in one direction, utilizing one of the few outlets they have to voice their preferences, which is their imperfect election, then the political elites in Iran are likely going to follow suit because they don't want to see, uh, they don't want to be seen as disconnected from the people. They want to be seen as having their finger on the pulse. And so if the political elites and the Iranian people are moving in one direction, the Supreme Leader does not want to be seen as the only person opposing a particular course of action. What he would much rather prefer is to give space to President Rouhani and his team to pursue their preferred course of action, voicing the fact that the Supreme Leader himself distrusts America very much. And so if a deal is struck, then he can say he supported it the entire time. But if the deal doesn't work, he can say, I warned you. I warned you about the United States pulling the rug out from underneath you, et cetera, et cetera. And then he can force President Rouhani and Rouhani's political coalition to follow a different course of action, to fall in line behind a more hard line course of action. So he's playing both sides. And because he is the most powerful unelected official in Iran, he has the luxury of being able to game things out into the future that elected officials in Iran, frankly, don't have. I hope that answers your question. Great. Um, and at this point, I, I should have mentioned before, if um, I'd like to invite people now to chat their questions to us. We do have a few more that have come in. Um, but if anyone else has additional questions, uh, please let me know, and I will uh, make sure that they get answered. But we have another question here, uh, another student from Georgetown Day School, uh, Mark Galani. Um, uh, what specifics of future deals between U.S. and Iran do you see after the six-month agreement ends? Well, the six-month agreement, uh, I should have mentioned before, that both sides have agreed that if it's in their interest to do so, they can renew it. Basically meaning if they make progress over the next six months, but not all of the progress they need to make, they can extend it uh, in order to create more time to get the broader deal. But I think in the bigger scheme of things, you know, what they're, they're going to try to organize this so that, first and foremost, they reach an agreement on what the overall technical aspects of Iran's nuclear program will look like when a final deal is reached. So what kind of limitations? Like, what will the inspections and verifications look like? How frequent will they be? And for how much longer will Iran be treated differently than other signatories of the non-proliferation group? Because we have to remember that if you reach a final deal, then you can't be treated differently for the rest of time. There has to be a mutually agreed upon time frame where Iran is treated differently in order to build trust. Is that going to be one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years? That's something they're going to have to agree upon. Agreeing that, uh, you, agreeing that Iran will be treated differently in order to build trust is much different. And, and they agree on that, but figuring out the time frame is going to be critical. Um, once you get beyond the aspects of the, the nuclear program itself, then you have to talk about, okay, well, what does the process of sanctions being lifted look like? Not only within the United Nations, not only within the European Union, but also within our own Congress. Um, Congress so far has not looked upon diplomacy very favorably, but sanctions cannot be lifted. Many sanctions cannot be lifted without Congress introducing legislation to lift them 
So at what point in the process does that happen? And what sanctions get listed when? And what are the reciprocal measures, meaning what steps does Iran take to limit its nuclear program and increase the transparency of it in correlation with what sanctions are being listed, right? Because there has to be symmetry in the deal. You can't ask Iran to take 25 steps, for example, and say, we're going to take five now and 20 later. And the Iranians are going to insist, and frankly, the United States should insist on the same, that if we take one step, you take one. If we take five, you take five. So creating that kind of symmetry is going to be critical. Then once that is done, that opens up the possibility to talk about these regional security issues, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, maybe Israel, Palestine. Maybe you talk about energy security. Non-proliferation can't be the only thing that you talk to Iran about, because Iran is not a nuclear program that just so happens to be attached to a country. Iran is a country that just so happens to have a nuclear program. So if you slay the wolf nearest the sled, so to speak, and make progress on the nuclear front, that opens up a window of opportunity to address all of these other issues that I've been talking about. So I hope that answers your question. Very good. Um, and kind of going along with what you were just talking about with the sanctions, um, Sam Stone, also from Georgetown Day, asks, uh, what happens if Congress votes to extend the sanctions uh, on Iran? Oh, it's very simple. If Congress uh, votes to extend sanctions, the deal is dead. Because um, you have to remember that Iran has hardliners, and we have hardliners. And if hardliners take steps to escalate the conflict, then that's going to empower hardliners in the other country. Consider the inverse. Pretend it was the Iranian parliament that introduced legislation to enrich uranium up to the 90% level, which is uh, needed for nuclear weapons, and to kick out inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency that currently have access to the vast majority of Iranian nuclear sites and uh, to turn off the cameras that are in Iranian facilities, and to finish the construction of Iran's heavy water facility within a one-month period, even though that's not technically feasible, but hypothetically speaking, so that it could produce plutonium that would be necessary for a nuclear bomb. Imagine if they did all of that. I think it would be well within the reason for not only the American Congress, but anybody in the United States to say the Iranians aren't serious about a deal. Here's the thing. A train can't run on two tracks. You're either doing diplomacy or you're doing sanctions. You can't do both at the same time. And we've been telling not only people within the United States, but also people around the world that we have a dual track policy. This is what we've been saying from the outset of Obama's presidency. And uh, I never really bought into it. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, because frankly, as we've been escalating sanctions and as the Iranians have been escalating technical aspects of their program, Diplomacy has been on life support. It wasn't until we stopped introducing new sanctions, and it wasn't until the Iranians stopped making technical advancements on the program that diplomacy started to bear fruit. And we should acknowledge these realities. And can I just uh, extend another question about sanctions? Because <clears throat> I think what you say is interesting about you know diplomacy and sanctions. They don't really work hand in hand. And um, some of the other issues that you mentioned that are obviously a conflict uh, between the U.S. and Iran are other issues such as human rights, terrorism. And what are some of these sanctions? Are you, there, there must be certain sanctions that are tied to these issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does that sort of interplay with uh, the nuclear deal? Well, what we've done in the negotiations is we've brought sanctions experts uh, as part of the American delegation, and the Europeans have brought their sanctions experts, and the Iranians have brought their sanctions experts. Um, so they're intimately familiar with uh, the type of sanctions that pertain to different things, some of which pertain to terrorism, some of which pertain to human rights, some of which pertain to the nuclear program. They understand full well that uh, the sanctions that pertain to non-nuclear related issues are going to be very difficult to lift in the short to medium term. That's going to have to come closer to the end of the sustained diplomatic process that can produce a comprehensive deal. Um, and that's why we need to understand here in the West that the most sensitive technical aspects of Iran's program are going to have to be achieved, limitations on those, are going to have to be achieved at the end of a deal, the end of the diplomatic process. We're not likely going to be able to get those up front. That goes back to this idea of symmetry that I was talking about before, where you can't ask for diamonds up front and then give peanuts in return, as a former Iranian nuclear negotiator had said. You want diamonds, you've got to give diamonds. I would argue that it's better to give peanuts in the beginning and work your way up to diamonds. 
so that you build trust along the way. And I think that's something that we've seen so far. Um, let's see here. Um, here's a, a, a slight shift here. Um, Sebastian Tetzer uh, from Georgetown Day uh, has asked, over the next decade, do you think that the U.S. will try to focus more on Iran and less on Saudi Arabia as relations with Iran continue to improve? It's a great question. You know, I think that uh, I would like to think that the United States has the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> you know, our relationship with Saudi Arabia is, is longstanding, and I don't foresee our relationship with the Saudis drastically changing anytime soon. And here's why. The Saudis are a major energy producer. And just because we might not be consuming as much Saudi oil as we used to, doesn't mean that other countries in the world aren't. And part of our security doctrine, that regional security framework that I was talking about before, it's predicated on stability in the region that can therefore facilitate secure access to energy resources, not just for the United States, but for the world as a whole. Because you have to remember, we run the world economy. So it matters very much that the Chinese, the Europeans, other Asian countries, ha you know, the Europeans as well, I think I said that, I apologize if I repeat it. It matters if these other countries that are not the United States have the st political stability in the region to facilitate secure access to energy resources. And we're the ones that help promote the security in that part of the world to ensure it. Um, it's going to be critical to maintain our relationship with the Saudis to that end. Um, the Iranians are right behind the Saudis in terms of being a massive energy producer. Getting Iranian oil and gas into international markets over an extended period of time could certainly help facilitate a reduction in energy costs and energy prices. That would certainly be beneficial to the Europeans, our Asian allies as well, other countries around the world. But that's more of a longer term process that we're talking about. You know, uh, like I said before, the Iranians are not willing to play by the rules of the game that we've set up. What they're willing to test, however, is our willingness to change those rules. Whether or not we're willing to change them remain to be seen. So far, we've been very hesitant to change them because if we change them for one country, then other countries who have been playing by the rules that we've had in place for decades are going to come to us and say, well, we want those rules. Why have we been playing by more stringent rules when you're giving more flexible rules to somebody else? change the rules of the game for one country, you might just have to change them for others. The saving grace in all of this is twofold. One, we know that the status quo is not working, right? If the status quo was working, the Arab Spring would not have taken place. If the status quo was working, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would not have been necessary. So clearly it's not working. The question now is, how do we shift the status quo to something more sustainable that helps solve conflict peacefully going forward into the future? We also know that not talking to Iran and fighting with Iran has exacerbated all of these problems. They haven't solved any of them. So testing the proposition of working with Iran to solve these problems, in addition to working with other countries, is what we're hoping to test out. Whether or not the Saudis want to go along with this remains to be seen, but they actually have a track record that predates 2005 of having a fairly decent working relationship with Iran. Uh, it's really old, it's been over the past eight to ten years that the relationship has deteriorated. And you've seen the Iranian foreign minister uh, go around the Persian Gulf to all of these countries, with the exception of Saudi Arabia so far. Uh, they haven't been able to work out a date yet for that meeting, but they're working on it. He's gone to all the Persian Gulf countries uh, in an effort to repair the relationship and start dialogue and figure out, you know, what are the common goals and, you know, how can they work together to promote a more stable region? And, that, and that's critical. Whether or not it bears fruit remain to be seen, but like I said before, the alternative has only produced death and destruction, and, and I think we need less of that, not more. Okay. Um, let's see here. Ah, this is an interesting question uh, from Caitlin Witter uh, from Georgetown Day. Uh, she asks, uh, do you think the U.S. will ever offer to destroy a portion of our nuclear weapon arsenal in order to further nuclear negotiations in the future? Great question. That's certainly something, that's an obligation we've signed on to, uh, not only us, but the Russians as well, reducing our stockpile. Uh, we haven't been as good at doing it as I would hope we would be, uh, but I think President Obama has you know, spoken out very positively on the need to uh, reduce the amount of weapons that exist in the world these kinds of weapons, nuclear weapons. 
and also ensure that new countries do not develop them. Um, there is a school of thought, which I happen to be a part of in Washington, D.C., that believes that the United States, because we are the superpower, can set a very powerful example by reducing our stockpiles. And that therefore incentivizes other countries to not only reduce theirs, but also prevent other countries from pursuing that path. But there has to be tangible progress. We have to be able to point to that progress to show that we're living up to our end of the bargain. And this is a, you know, this is a political and ideological difference of opinion that is not just between Republicans and Democrats, but also within the Democratic Party itself. Um, we have a president who prefers to go down the path of making concrete and sustained reduction. But our president does not rule by fiat. You know, he has to work with the Congress and, and other agencies in the U.S. government to carry out these policies. And um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the Congress hasn't exactly been playing nice with the president on any issue since he, uh, since he came into the White House. So it's not just on him. We need all of our leaders across the board to demonstrate a willingness to take these kinds of risks with these. It can't just be the president. So. Interesting. Um, so Ah, okay. Um, I have another question here. Um, let's see, from uh, Christine Keene. Uh, she asks, could you speculate how Iran might be willing to be helpful on Afghanistan and Syria as part of a larger deal? Great question. Yeah, I mean, everybody's asking good questions. You know, <laughs> on, Afghanistan, on Afghanistan, you know, we only need to look back to what the Iranians did in 2001 um, after 9-11. They cooperated extensively militarily through intelligence and on the political level with the United States to help bring into power the government that's ruling Afghanistan now. Our former special envoy to Afghanistan at the time, his name is Ambassador Jim, Jim Dobbin. You know, he's on the record. You could Google this and see it for yourself, saying how at the 11th hour, the deal in 2001 to create the new post-Taliban government was about to fall apart. And the gentleman who just so happens to be the Iranian foreign minister now took some Afghan leaders in a back room, whispered in their ear, and then they came out and agreed to make concessions that were necessary to facilitate the political agreement that produced the post-Taliban government. The Iranians were very interested and communicated to the United States, the Bush administration at the time, a willingness to continue this collaboration and extend it beyond Afghanistan to other issues. Uh, President Bush and uh, you know his neoconservative foreign policy advisors responded by putting Iran in the act of evil in President Bush's 2002 State of the Union address. That's pretty much when Iran's helpful role in Afghanistan uh, died down. Uh, it was a slow deterioration after that. But our interests with Iran overlap in Afghanistan significantly, and they've demonstrated consistently uh, over the past eight to ten years a willingness to, uh, to negotiate with us on these issues. And especially now that we have the team that worked with us in the past, running Iranian foreign policy once again, I would say that uh, it's well within the realm of possibility. We have a golden opportunity, and we'd be foolish not to see it. Now, on Syria, it's a little trickier. Um, you know, the Iranians, everybody knows, has been backing the Assad government. Uh, the Russians have as well, but the Iranians are one of the two biggest supporters of the Assad government. But the Iranians have lost a lot of soft power in the Middle East. Their reputation has taken a massive hit in the eyes of the Arab world as a result of their support for somebody that's killing his own people. So while they want to make sure that there isn't a, a rapid political transition uh, in Syria to jihadi extremists uh, that you know would seek to uh, you know adversely affect uh, Iranian interests, what they would be willing to do is to negotiate over the process and exert influence and leverage that they have vis-a-vis -vis Assad and Assad's advisors to participate uh, in a process that can facilitate a political solution to stop the killing and create elections, things of that nature. So far, we haven't been willing to include Iran in this process, which, to be frank, has been foolish because the United Nations and countless other countries around the world have said that there's no solution without the Iranians at the table. And privately, I can tell you that there's no shortage of American officials that will involve but American officials can't come out and publicly contradict the official stated policy of the United States. I think because there's a new foreign policy team in Iran that wants to take its Syria policy in a different direction, uh, the United States should be willing to test that proposition. And, you know, we've floated the idea of including Iran in peace talks that have been ongoing between uh, the various parties that can influence uh, those inside Syria. 
but we haven't seen uh, the process actually materialize yet. So I'll tell you one thing, we're not going to be able to find a peaceful political solution that's durable, that can stop the killing, unless Iran is part of the diplomatic process. And you don't need to take my word for it. You know, the UN Special Envoy has said the exact same thing. The longer the Iranians are not at the table, the longer the killing goes on. So we should ask ourselves, how concerned are we really about the killing in Syria if we continue to refuse to include Iran in the diplomatic process? That's a question that's very uncomfortable for the Obama administration to answer. Good. <clears throat> we have uh, one more question here. And again, I'd like to urge people, we do still have a few minutes left, so if you do have any questions, uh, please check those in to us. Um, the question here is from Jordan S. at Georgetown Day. Uh, it reads, I read an article by David Cohen, who did much of the framework for the sanctions in uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, I guess the article was in the Wall Street Journal. He says that while our sanctions have been established through the deal, the harm to Iran's economy will continue and even increase in the next six months. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, on um, that part of the article that he wrote, he's right. Because the, the primary infrastructure of the sanctions that we have in Iran are sanctions on Iranian oil exports and Iran's banking infrastructure. And those sanctions haven't been touched. Those are the sanctions that will only get touched towards the end of a broader diplomatic process. Just like the most sensitive aspects of Iran's nuclear program won't be touched until the end of a broader diplomatic process. So he's right in saying that Iran will continue to feel pain. Uh, the part that he left out is we couldn't lift those sanctions today even if we wanted to, because we're going to need to work with the Congress to do it. And there needs to be more progress at the negotiating table that both sides can demonstrate before we can start to change the opinion uh, of some people in Congress who might be on the fence or who might be skeptical. Uh, so we're still going to retain a tremendous amount of leverage vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians because we have oil sanctions and banking sanctions. But if you aren't willing to test the proposition of trading in that leverage for Iranian concessions of equal value, what you have isn't leverage. What you have is a baseball bat that you're beating the Iranians with over a head. Because the leverage is only good, it, it, leverage is only as good as your willingness to use it. So that's what we have to test now. If we're not willing to test it, then you know it's not leverage. It's, the end of the day. it's something that we're trying to keep in place in in perpetuity and destroy the diplomatic process. Very good. Um, as we're waiting for any additional questions to come in, I, I have a question, um, and let me see if I can formulate it properly. But uh, as you were talking, I, I guess this this idea of um, you know talking about uh, nuclear proliferation and um, it seems like it can be very important a point in a way because there's tangible things that can be reached and done on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but then as the, the dialogue continues and start going into some of the other issues that you addressed, human rights, um, terrorism, and things like that, that obviously our uh, government and our Congress, who has been very difficult with Obama, um, has, you know, these are things that they, they grab onto. And I guess I just think about sort of the, the problems that were happening in Congress with uh, Russia, when they were entering the WTO and lifting certain sanctions dealing with human rights, uh, in particular for, for Russia, and the difficulty of lifting those sanctions. And I'm just wondering, um, do you see that perhaps the, the conversation sort of breaking down once we get past the discussion of uh, nuclear uh, issues? It's a very real possibility, and we should be clear-eyed in our assessment of that possibility. You know, it took eight years for us to lift sanctions on Iraq at the UN. Uh, and it took almost the same amount of time for the Congress to lift sanctions on Iraq. We had invaded a country, we helped facilitate a new government to come into power, and we were essentially still sanctioning it. Um, so, you know, the psychology behind sanctions, uh, once you start to really take a look at it, uh, can become a bit perplexing. But at the end of the day, um, I think the Iranians understand that it's not even just that they understand. It's something that they've said very clear. They said, look, you know, you have political obstacles and we have political obstacles. That's true. And they said, it's going to be very difficult for you to do certain things, especially when it comes to lifting things, not just on the negotiation, but also these other issues, terrorism, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. 
they get that. They said it's going to be very difficult for us to convince our hardliners to take steps on other kinds of issues that uh, previously they have demonstrated unwillingness to, to examine. But that's just it. Leaders have to be willing to take risks. With people. There's no other way to solve conflict in the world. You know, uh, if it continues to be what's called a zero-sum game, meaning one side wins and thus the other side loses, the other side, one of those sides isn't really winning. Because if there is a loser, then that is incentivizing the side which is losing more to continue to escalate the conflict in ways that can hurt the other side. Rather than a zero-sum game or lose-lose scenario, we need to move down a path where leaders are taking risks to create win-win outcomes. And win-win outcomes are not only much more difficult to sell politically, they're also much more difficult to construct, especially between two countries that have been fighting for over three decades, like the U.S. and Iran. So just because something is difficult doesn't mean that you don't do it, especially when you consider the alternative. Because the alternative to this process is war. It really is. And you don't need to take my word for it, because the president has gone to the podium and said those exact words. So it's the responsibility of people who are skeptical of diplomacy or are saying that diplomacy can't work to clearly articulate what their alternative is. Because if they're being intellectually honest, they'll say the alternative is war, and that's exactly what I want. If they don't say that, then they're not being honest. And we need to have honest conversations in this country about war and peace. Because we went to war with one country without having that conversation in 2003. And the effects, the negative effects that it's had on the United States, politically, economically, socially, have been massive. Massive. And I would argue that we should do everything in our power to avoid repeating that outcome. I would also argue that it's well within the realm of possibility, even though it will be difficult, to do precisely that with Iran. You just have to be willing to take those risks. So with all of that, and, and obviously the, um, the positive movement that's going forward, do you think it's possible that the Congress, uh, that Congress may not lift sanctions? I mean, that they will just be difficult and, and decide, you know, no. It's possible. I think right now they're focused on making sure that no new sanctions are introduced or passed. Um, and once you cross that first hurdle, that initial hurdle, you create momentum, not just in terms of Obama's relationship with Congress on this issue, but also at the negotiating table between Iran and the United States, so that you can start to examine ways. And I think they already are examining ways of how do we undo this? Because you know, the people that created the sanctions were never incentivized to think, create a path to undo it all, right? Because they were true believers in the fact that sanctions needed to happen, and they never should be lifted. Well, now the president has said, no, no, we need to examine how to lift them. So not only does he have the architects of the sanctions examining how to undo it, but he also has new people examining how to undo it. Because you can't rely on the people who put them in place in the first place exclusively. You need to bring in another set of people who, you know, maybe have a bit uh, clearer vision, if you will, to figure out how it gets done. And the Iranians have to do the same thing on not only the technical aspects of their program, their NIFA program, but also on their broader strategy uh, in the region. Like, what parts are they going to undo? What parts are negotiable? What parts are their red lines? Uh, and the reason why this is so tough is because this is we're in uncharted waters. These aren't conversations that we've ever had before. Just because you've never done something before doesn't mean you should try. That's true. Um, we are definitely in uh, uncharted waters and in many, many respects. Uh, so it's a very interesting time. Um, but uh, so let me ask you, um, oh, one moment. Um, oh, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the other parties, um, particularly France and, and others, um, some of their objectives uh, in the negotiation? Sure. I mean, this is one of the most challenging aspects of, of this diplomatic process is that it's not a bilateral you know, one-on-one -on -one talk between Iran and America. You have, you know, five other countries in addition to Iran and America. And no two countries have identical interests. Different countries are going to focus on different things and prioritize different things. It reminds me of this old saying that, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen and nobody has a spoon. It's just really tough. And, you know, when they were negotiating in Geneva, you know, the United States and Iran hammered out a bilateral agreement and they presented it to the what's called the B5 plus one. And then the French in the 11th hour made a bunch of changes to the agreement. And it threw off that symmetry that I was talking about in the deal. 
And then that caused them to have to go into a round three in Geneva to try and square those differences. And, you know, eventually they were able to do it. But because we started to ask the Iranians for more, we had to be willing to give them more in the interim deal. Um, so, you know, like Russia and China certainly have their own interests. Um, on the one hand, the Chinese are making a killing in Iran economically because all the Western countries have sanctioned themselves out of the Iranian market. So the Chinese, while they might not have an interest in seeing the overall relationship with Iran and the United States or Iran and the world improve so that Iranian markets become diversified, they also understand that they can't stop it. Uh, they're not powerful enough within the UN Security Council or on a global stage more generally to prevent a diplomatic process from going forward the same way that the United States could if we choose to do so. Uh, the Russians don't want to see another war in the Middle East. The Russians enjoy poking their finger in the eye of the United States. And the Russians don't want to see uh, Iranian oil and gas make a massive and rapid return to international markets. Because the less oil and gas that Iran is supplying to Europe, the more dependent Europe becomes on Russia. And we've seen Russia turn off the spigot to certain European countries in recent years as a way of showing leverage, exerting leverage over these countries. So the, Europe's ability to diversify is going to be critical, and one of the best ways that they can diversify is getting Iranian oil back online. And they know this. They know this very well. Uh, and coincidentally, it's much easier for the European Union to lift their oil embargo on Iran than it is, for example, for the United States to lift sanctions in the Congo. So another way to make progress on sanctions that I should have mentioned is for the European Union sanctions to come undone before the Americans say. Um, and, you know, then you have other countries, the European countries like the French, the British. And these are countries that had robust economic relationships with Iran in the 90s and uh, up until, you know, Ahmadinejad got elected in 2005. Shortly thereafter, those relationships started to recede. The Germans as well continue to have, you know, strong economic relationships with Iran. And the businesses in these countries would like to see the relationship improve so that they can get back in the Iranian market. But businesses making uh, businesses having an impact on the political decision makers in these countries, you know, they're only as effective as their willingness to lobby. And you know, lobbying for positive things on Iran right now, it, it never has been the easiest thing in the world to do. And even though progress is being made at the negotiating table, it still isn't easy. So the more progress is made at the negotiating table the easier it will become for businesses, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and elsewhere, to lobby for more flexibility on the part of their government when dealing with Iran so that their economic interests can be addressed. Um, unpacking all of this is going to be critical, and the Iranians are going to play a critical role in unpacking it. They have to be very strategic in how they create new economic linkages with all of these countries, because if it looks like they're going to sell the Chinese short, that increases the uh, incentive for the Chinese to slow down the diplomatic process. Same with the Russians. If it looks like they're giving too many contracts to America, it increases the incentive for some of the European countries to slow the process down. So Iran is going to have to be, you know, very, very strategic and very careful in, you know, what kind of economic relationships they establish with who and to make sure that there's balance between them across the board so as not to upset the broader diplomatic process. So what, where do you see everything? Um, what are your hopes or, or what do you see a year from now and say five years from now? Well, you know, my glass is half full because I believe in the power of diplomacy. I believe that when leaders take these risks for peace, you know, the likelihood is high that uh, a solution can be found. Because like I said before, every conflict ends with a negotiation. It just comes down to when are you willing to cash in the chips that you've built up, the leverage that you've built up through escalating the conflict through punitive measures. And I think that the United States has been very honest in recent weeks in saying that we've built up a tremendous amount of leverage, but the longer we wait to use it, the lower that leverage becomes. And the greater the incentive the rest of the world has to start to not abide by the sanctions that we've put forward. The reason why the rest of the world has gone along with sanctions that, quite frankly, go against their own economic interests, right? Because this is the thing. We had sanctioned ourselves out of influence in Iran years ago. The sanctions that have come in place over the past two to three years have essentially convinced other countries, and in some cases, strong-armed other countries, from doing business with Iran. 
we premised this on the idea that the problem existed in Tehran, not in Washington, and that if Iranians were willing to negotiate in good faith, in a period of time. Well, by most accounts, with the possible exception of extremists in Europe, Washington, and Tel Aviv, the Iranians are negotiating in good faith right now. If they continue to, then we're going to have to find a way to reduce the sanctions in the short and medium term so that it doesn't look like the problem is in Washington instead of Tehran. And making that kind of progress over the short to medium term over the next year, I think is very doable. And I, and I think they'll be able to do it precisely because the alternative is war and neither side wants that. Over the next five years, I mean, it's gonna be, we've got both sides have some very tough choices to make. Very tough choices to make. On the America side, are they willing to change the regional security framework that they set up after the British withdrew following World War II? Are we willing to, uh, you know, not create rules of the game that require a patron-client relationship, but instead predicate regional security on win-win outcomes? It's not something that we've done in our recent past, uh, but because of the political flux uh, given how fluid things are in this part of the world, I think it's a proposition worth testing. And the Iranians are a perfect testing because the amount of political stability that exists in Iran, and there is political instability there, is nothing compared to what we're seeing in Egypt, Tunisia, Iraq, Afghanistan, other countries in the broader world. Um, and on the Iranian side, you know, they have to decide whether or not ideology or you know, practical, real-world interests are going to guide their policy making. There's been numerous occasions over the past 30 years where the Iranians have sacrificed their ideology for more practical, you know, regime survival uh, interests or more practical, uh, you know, foreign policy interests. Uh, and there's also been times where they prioritize ideology over what they've stated and demonstrated in the reputation for interest to be. Uh, their ability to fluctuate between those two things is going to be minimal, if non-existent, if they want a deal with the United States. Because a deal is going to be predicated on knowing that Iran is going to live up to its end of the bargain. And that's going to mean that there's going to have to be a bit of shift in what Iran's ideology is. That doesn't mean that Iran has to go from an enemy of the United States to best friends with the United States. Frankly, I don't think that's what the other side is looking for. But can Iran go from an enemy of the United States to a rival? That's, that's the more realistic framing of what this process could look like over the next couple of years. Uh, the people that are running Iran right now, the executive branch, the president and his team, believe that it's in Iran's critical national security interest to make that shift. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not they can do it, and it remains to be seen whether or not uh, we will meet them halfway. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us here today. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, we have one last question and then, sure. and then uh, we will run out of time. Um, but do you think that there's, uh, Sue, Sue Eikenberry from Georgetown Day has asked um, if, if there is any hope for an improvement regarding human rights in Iran? Great question, Sue. <laughs> um, I'd like to think so. I mean, we should be realistic about how terrible Iran's human rights record is. But we should also be realistic that even though it's been terrible for a long time, there has been an ebb and flow where there have been improvements and then there's been deterioration. That doesn't mean that if they make improvements, we should stop focusing on it. I'm a big proponent of not sacrificing human rights for a deal because that would create the kind of a, a relationship with Iran that we had during the time of the Shah. And that's why they had a one of the many reasons why they had a revolution because people did not like the fact that uh, that kind of relationship existed between Iran and the United States. So it's actually in America's interest to make sure that we don't go to war with Iran, we figure out a way to work with this government, but also empower the people inside the country who are seeking to make the indigenous peaceful changes to Iran's government that are long overdue. And a big part of that is Iran's human rights record. I think that uh, we have seen some improvements so far, but not anywhere close to the kind of improvements that we'd all like see. I'm also realistic in that making broad-based improvements over your first 100 days in office is not entirely realistic. 
and we only need to look at our own president, what he achieved in his first 100 days, to see that it's easier said than done. But until we see progress on this goal, the kind of progress that we'd all like to see, it's going to be vital to utilize international organizations like the United Nations to continue to hold the Iranian government accountable and empower the people inside the Iranian government that want to make those kinds of changes. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they're plentiful, but they do exist. They do exist. And if we can demonstrate to them that their cooperation on human rights issues through international organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, the UN, things like that, we can demonstrate that making progress with these organizations means they'll be criticized when they deserve to be criticized, but they'll be praised when they make improvements. I think that creates a window of opportunity. And I think that's typically how these human rights organizations that are internationally respected operate. So the ball is definitely in the Iranian government's court because it's their responsibility to treat their people better. But there's also things that we can do in the international community to empower those inside of Iran who would like to make those kinds of changes. I'm optimistic. But I certainly could won't promise the world because uh, every time we seem to do that, the Iranian government seems to find a way uh, to make all of us look wrong. But I put a lot of hope in the Iranian people being able to push for the changes that they'd like to see. And, uh, you know, that gives me hope for the future. Well, I think this is a great, great point to stop. And I just want to thank you so much for, yeah. for joining us. And, um, being part of our first, very first webinar. Yeah. Um, and I, it'll be a very interesting time to see what happens in the future. It was fun. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And for those um, who are interested in finding out more about our webinars and to get on our mailing list, uh, here you can contact me, Amanda Stamp, at uh, astamp at worldaffairscc.org um, or call us here at the office. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much. Bye.